The Lord be with you. Well, it just occurred to me this morning that on this Sunday in 2013 was the first time I stood in this pulpit as your pastor. Uh, so it's only right that I don't get to stand in it today, right? Um, but on that, that first year, I went with a group of our youth to Passport, and we went to Danville, Virginia. And while we were there, uh, many of us went in different directions and did many of the wonderful things we do at Passport. And I thought, man, I'll probably never have anything ever to do with this city ever again. Because uh, then we went to Jacksonville, I think, the next year. So fast forward to this summer. I was sitting uh, in one of the D-Men seminars, a little time, a little awkward time, when it's the first one and everybody's in the room. And all the people who went to one seminary, they all know each other. And then the rest of us are just sort of looking at the clock, wondering when class is going to start. And I started talking to this guy who said he was from Danville, Virginia. I was like, oh, I went there once. And this is how I went. And he was like, yeah, people do that. Um, and then after, as the class went on uh, during the week, Josh Hearn came over to me and said, hey, I don't know if you know this yet, we're going to be friends. I was like, who is this crazy person? <laughs> and you know what? Two things happened. Uh, we became friends, and I found out he is indeed a crazy person. And so, no, but Josh, uh, I'm thrilled that you're here, man. I'm glad you're here, and I turn it over to you now. Uh, Josh, earn my good friend. It has been a while since my introduction has involved uh, the degree to which I am or am not uh, crazy. Um, <laughs> but you will notice that I do not dispute it. Um, anyway. Thank you all so much for having me here today. I am coming to you from Danville, Virginia, uh, and uh, bring you greetings from uh, Grace and Maine Fellowship in Danville, Virginia. It's a, an intentional Christian community in Danville. Um, we have hosted some folks from FBC Williams at Passport. I believe they've come and worked with us on a couple of different things. Um, Let's read scripture. It's, it's in the, the Gospel of Luke in the 15th chapter, beginning in the 11th verse. I'll read. Feel free to follow along if you like. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place through, the, through that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, 
son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Let's pray. Lord, give us the ears to hear and the eyes to see. Open our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this story. Adore this story. And I'm sure that if we ask the room, many of you would also say that you love this story, right? If there was, if I walk, is that going to bother y'all? If I move around any? That's good. I'm going to do it anyway, so if it bothers you, maybe look the other way. Um, is my mic on? If there was a greatest hits of the New Testament, this would be on, on it. The prodigal son would be on the greatest hits album of the New Testament if we had one, right? Right there with the Good Samaritan, right there with a handful. The prodigal son. Of course, we call it the story of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. We could probably also call it like the parable of the loving father or uh, the parable of the, um, what's the nice word for the older brother? The unrepentant older brother, the, um, the hesitant older brother, um, the jealous older brother. What a story. And, but we, I think we miss something in the telling of it, in the retelling of it over the years, because I don't think we always have the ears to hear exactly how it would have sounded to that first audience. When the brother says, Father... Give me the half of the property that will be mine. There's a big dot, dot, dot on the end of that sentence, right? Give me the half of the property that will be mine when you die. Give me the half of the property that will be mine when you die is kind of like saying to your father, you're worth more to me dead than you are alive. I'd rather have my part of your property than you. And so, the original audience, fully aware of the Ten Commandments and honor your father and mother, not wish them dead for their things, would have responded viscerally. It would have hit them in the stomach. The idea of a, of a son saying, Father, give me the half that's mine. I, I just can't wait for you to die. And so we already know, at least in that traditional storytelling style, who the villain is, right? In the, in the opening lines, one of the characters wishes their father dead. That's, you know, we call that telegraphing and storytelling, right? That's a pretty clear indication of who the bad guy is. And I come from uh, eastern Kentucky. I don't know if you've ever been there. Um, you've probably never been to where I'm from. No one's been to where I'm from. <clears throat> But in Eastern Kentucky, the storytelling style, you know, you boo and you hiss the villains. I don't know if, are y'all booers and hissers? Is that a thing you can do? Like, do we boo and hiss in Alabama, or is that just a, a mountain thing, right? Okay, I'm, bless your heart. Okay, bless your heart. Well, you can bless your heart, the prodigal son, right? <clears throat> and the story goes on that the father does it. He now, let's be clear, to do this, he can't just go down to, like, First Israel Bank and, like, withdraw half of his property. All, his, his wealth, his possessions are not liquid, is what they're, you know, right? They are in, primarily in land and animals and buildings. You can't liquidate these things. So for him to give half the property means he has to sell half of his possessions, turn that into money, and then give that to his son. And so not only is he giving half of his property. He's breaking up his family's inheritance, his family's land, the land that was probably given to him by his father and his father's father and his father's father's father. And they give them the money. And off he goes, and I believe the NRSV says he squanders it in dissolute living. Is that what it is? Yeah, squanders it in dissolute living, which is such a powerful phrase, isn't it? It suggests a lot of things without saying anything in particular. You can insert your own favorite vices into that dissolute living. They all fit under dissolute living, right? <clears throat> and he spends half of his father's wealth. 
that's not easy, but he's talented. And so he spends half of his family's possessions. And when he had spent everything, it says a severe famine took place throughout the country. What timing? <clears throat> and he began to be hungry. He began to be in need. So he goes and he hires himself out to somebody. And what's the job he has? Slopping pigs. And it says that he was so hungry, so desperate, that he'd have done anything. He even longed to eat the pods that the pigs were eating. I don't know about you. I have never been so hungry that I would eat hog slop. Yeah, I, 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 I never in my life have I been so desperate that I looked at hog slop and said, like, oh, that part looks not bad. <laughs> That's how bad things are. And then he has this epiphany, this grand realization where he says, oh, how many of my father's slaves, servants, workers, how many of them have plenty of food? They have enough bread to eat, and then they have, enough, they have bread to spare. I'll go back to my father, and I won't ask him to take me back as his son. I'll ask him to maybe, maybe mercifully let me be his servant. And then he goes down the road. He's got this speech kind of cooked up in him, right? He's got this speech ready. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. It's a good opening line. It's a confession. It's, your, it's, it's like, it's a, I'm sorry, I goofed up, Sorry. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Ooh, that's a good second line, right? It really gets to the heart of the matter. And then treat me as one of your hired servants. Hit the ask on that third line. I love it. He knows what he's doing. He's got a great speech. And you know, maybe you've done this before. I'm sure all of y'all were good um, uh, studiers in school, but uh, some of us weren't. And... Um, you know, you're practicing as you, get to the, as you head toward the test. You're going over your answers. You're, you're, you're quizzing yourself and getting ready. The whole way he's coming home, I promise you, it's not in the text, but we'll read between the lines. The whole way home, you know he's, he's repeating to himself, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Right? Over and over and over again, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he tries every different version of this speech. He says, well, maybe if I say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called. He's, he's tried every move and every line. He knows this in and out, right? And it says that the Father sees him while he was still a long way off. Oh, we run right over this line too often. Maybe the most beautiful line in the entire story. Because the only way that the father sees his son from a long way off is if he's waiting and looking. Every day going out to the road and looking down the road and wondering, maybe today is the day that my son comes home. The son who wished me dead the son who shattered our family's heritage. Maybe today's the day he comes home. And then one day he sees a man coming up over the hill and he's too far away to really recognize his facial features. Or the, but, you know, he can tell by the way he's walking. As a father, right? He can tell by the, by the gait of, this, of his son coming over the hill. He knows that's... That's my son. That's how he walks. That's how he holds himself. That's, that's how his shoulders look when he turns to, to shield his eyes from the sun. That's my son. And he runs to him, which is not as simple an interaction as you might imagine because he's likely wearing a robe that he has to hitch up around his hip to run. So he hitches up his robe and he runs to his son and he wraps him up in his arms. And please note what happens in that moment. The son who has practiced this speech says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But before you can get the next line out, almost like the father is injured, wounded by the story that his son is telling. Father, I've sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He cuts him off. He interrupts him. He won't let him ask for the thing that he wants to ask for. 
like our Father, this Father lavishes us with grace, with a furious love. And so he cuts him off. And he says, this is my son, flesh of my flesh. This is my beloved son. Leaves out the part about the death wish. It says, go and get a robe and put it on his shoulders. Get a ring, one of the ones that's our family's, and put that on his, on his finger. Go and get the fatted calf. We're going to kill it. We're going to celebrate because my son that was dead is alive. My son that was lost is found. And so they throw a party. In fact, they throw such a party that it says that when the older brother comes up close to the home, he can hear music. Okay, that's not too hard. He can also hear dancing. It's got to be quite the party before you can hear the dancing from outside, right? He can hear the dancing and the music, and he calls one of the servants and says, what's happened? I, I don't know about you. Maybe you've got a little bit of social anxiety. There's a big party going on where the dancing is that boisterous, and you think, like, maybe I figure out what's going on in here before I go in there, right? And so he, the servant, he asked one of the servants, what's going on? And they said, oh, your brother came home, and your father's killed the fatted calf. We're having a party. He was dead and is alive, lost and is found, right? The servant knows the story. And the older brother is incensed. He is furious. And let's be honest, for good reasons. He's mad for very rational reasons. For a very, for a very, he's very, it's very reasonable to be mad. His own brother wished their father dead. His own brother left the farm and left him to do a lot of the work, right? His own brother fractured the family's heritage so that whatever was left over would eventually be the older brothers, but it's been broken. It's been changed. And so he doesn't go into the party. And his father comes out, right? The loving father comes out to the older brother and says, why aren't you coming inside? And the older brother lets loose with a tirade that is too exact to be spontaneous. Because every day the father's been going out to the roadside and looking down the road thinking maybe today is the day. And every day the older brother has seen his father do this. And his heart has grown hard at even the thought of possible mercy. And so he's practiced his speech. It's not in the text, but we can read between the lines. He's practiced his speech too, right? I want to do it justice. And so... He became angry and refused to go in. And he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your, own, your command. Maybe true. Probably not. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours... Ooh, that's a tricky way of putting it, isn't it? Do we have a word in English for what happens when you share a father and you're both, like when two men share a father? What is that? I think that's called brothers, right? Do we have that word? Yeah. But he says, no, when this son of yours came back, his brother is dead to him. His brother is not his brother, according to him. When this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. Nothing for me, but he gets everything? And then the father says to him, Son, you are always <coughs> with me. And all that is mine is yours. Literally, the half of the property that's left. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this, this brother of yours 
was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Notice that. The older brother says, when this son of yours came home, and the father's response is firm, loving, and says, when this brother of yours. In other words, you don't get to disown just because he did these things. You don't get to disown him. He's still your brother. Dad gets to decide in this case. They are brothers because of what they share, not because of how they agree. What a story. Do you think the older brother went into the party after that? I don't know. The story stops there. Like most good stories, it leaves you wanting for more. And I kind of wonder, do you think he went in the next day? Or then in the next moment? Maybe the next scene was him in, this, in the party? I don't know. I think the story's left there to leave us wondering. Are we going to go into the party? Are we going to stay outside on the patio and listen to the dancing? I also kind of wonder the next day. Like, do you think the next day, do you think the prodigal son was still there the next day? Or did he trip off back down the road to come home another day again? It's been our experience in our work. We do a lot of work in Danville, Virginia, with people experiencing things like homelessness, addiction, poverty, hunger, it's been our work in working with addiction that you know, relapse is the rule. Prodigals come home oftentimes many times, not just once. I wonder. The one thing that seems constant in the story, regardless, is the father's deep, deep love. A love bigger than even his son's hatred, even in his son's jealousy, even in his son's Offense at wishing him dead? In our work, I want to tell you a story about one of our, our folks. We're an intentional Christian community in Danville, Virginia. Uh, my wife, Jessica, uh, who, by the way, I'm sorry that you, you get me and not my wife and my beautiful daughter, um, my condolences. Um, but bronze is really not that bad, guys. You still get to stand on the podium. Um, my wife is Cooperative Baptist Fellowship field personnel. She is one of the missionaries supported by the Offering for Global Mission. And so on her behalf and on the behalf of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, thank you. Thank you for your generosity, for your kindness, for your prayers, for your love and your support. We can't do what we do without folks like you. What we do is that we live in intentional community with people experiencing things like homelessness, addiction, hunger, poverty. And we do a lot of good old-fashioned relationship building. We have a lot of coffee. We sit on a lot of porches. We get to know folks and build relationships. And when folks are ready to get shelter or uh, to stabilize their life, then we're there and part of that life already. And uh, we open our homes, provide places for people to have shelter. Uh, we have six different hospitality houses spread out throughout our city where folks can come and uh, stay in the extra bedroom if they need a place to sleep, or they can eat at our tables, or they can get a drink of water, or use the shower or the bathroom, or just sit on the porch and talk about nothing. Uh, it's hospitality. We do that. We do a lot of meals every year. We do uh, a bunch of uh, uh, shared meals. We do family-style meals, right? We don't. There's nobody serving you. My mom always said, if you've got you know, two arms and two legs, you can probably make your own plate. Am I wrong, right? Anybody? No? All right. So uh, people make their own plate because there's a certain dignity in being able to make your own plate. We have what we call the cauliflower doctrine, which means if you don't like cauliflower or something else, you don't have to have that at the meal, right? It's, it's kind of common sense stuff. We call it the cauliflower doctrine because I don't like cauliflower. But we are in many ways, we are a community made up of prodigal sons and daughters, folks who have made big mistakes and have tripped our way down the road back home to be surprised by a loving father who was waiting for us, 
whose mercy is bigger than our sin, whose grace is stronger than our failures. And what we've found in doing this work is that it's prodigal sons and daughters, frankly, that make up the church. That the kingdom is full of prodigals. Older brothers are still sitting on the patio listening to the dancing. We all come back on our knees with a speech in our heart that God won't let us finish. It makes me think about Bruce, one of our guys. Bruce, who when we first met him was sleeping underneath a house in one of the neighborhoods. Um, when it rained, everything he had got wet. He moved shortly thereafter out from underneath that house to living in an old rotted out tool shed. Bruce, who when he first came to one of our meals, he came because we pestered him constantly. Pestered him over and over and over again. Come on, man, you got to come, you got to come. And he said, sure, 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 I'll come. And then he wouldn't come. And then finally, one of his friends, another man experiencing homelessness, said, no, you really need to go. And he said, if you'll shut up about it, I'll go. And so he did. He came once. And when he came, he came with a cheap bottle of gin in his pocket, and he'd sneak away to the bathroom every so often to take a nip. But he came and he ate, and he would tell me months later, he would say, I didn't believe that you loved me. Not then. But I could tell that you loved each other, and it was kind of nice to be near it. Something that has become a part of the way we think about what we do. Sometimes it's just nice to be near love, even if you can't yet believe that you are love. Makes me wonder if maybe that's not a little bit of what's happening with the older brother. He can't quite leave. He wants to believe in the Father's love, but he's afraid. The only way he knows how to be loved is to make himself worthwhile and useful. And so he sits on the patio and he waits and he wonders if maybe he could be loved like that too. Anyway, Bruce... Bruce is not good at sitting still. Bruce is a worker. He was a carpenter by profession before he kind of burned all his bridges. The match he used to set fire to all those bridges was, uh, was alcohol, addiction. And he would come to our meals, and after a little while, he realized that, uh, that we had our tables set up kind of strange. This is back when the meal was in my house every Thursday night. Every Thursday night, big open meal. Anybody can come, and we learned real fast how many people can fit in our house at one time for a meal. I still don't know the number if you're just standing. That seems like a, like a stunt. But I can tell you that we can have 51 people over for dinner. That's the limit. If you're number 52, I have terrible news. We tried putting dining room tables up on, on, on stairs, but the food just kind of flies off one end. And, uh, and so we, we actually soon discovered Bruce has got this spatial mind, right? He's a carpenter by profession. Uh, he, he's got this mind and this, this idea, and he was able to move the tables and chairs around so that we could find a, a way to fit another table into our home for this meal. He kept coming because he felt that there was love there, even if he didn't yet feel loved. He actually knew where all the glasses and forks and plates were in my house before I did when we moved in because he had to. He was like, we called him our quartermaster. He was the one who knew where everything was. He knew where the spare chairs were and the spare table was, and he knew just exactly how long the butter had been in the dish. He kept track because he wanted to do something. Time went on, and he kept coming, and then one meal, uh, a few months in, he, a little boy, uh, we'll call the little boy uh, uh, Eric. That's not his real name. If I use a different name to describe him, just ignore that other name because... I try to use fake names. Anyway, so Eric, a little boy, four years old, sits down next to Bruce, and Bruce looks on the table to Eric's mom, and Eric's mom says, well, if it's okay with Mr. Bruce, you can sit there. Bruce kind of nods, and they go about eating a little longer. And then a little while later, I look down, and Bruce is leaning over and talking to Eric, and he says, you need to eat three more bites of your chicken and two more bites of your broccoli. Anybody ever played that game? Anybody? Yeah, three more bites of chicken, two more bites of broccoli. If you do that, then you get to have dessert. Right, Mom? And she says, yeah, sure. Like, she's got like five kids. She's just glad that someone is helping a child eat, right? Three more bites of chicken, two more bites of broccoli. You eat that, and you get to have dessert. 
And if you don't get to have dessert, I don't get to have dessert. Oh, man, he's playing like the expert game, right? And it's cherry pie, and that's my favorite. It really is his favorite. A little while later, I look down, and he's got the last piece of broccoli on the fork. He's holding it up, and he's going, please, buddy, I really like cherry pie. He eats the broccoli. They get their pie. It's a nice story if it ends there, but it doesn't, right? That's the beautiful thing about stories, especially prodigal stories. They don't end there. The next day, he calls me, and he says, I have got to get clean. And I, and I asked him weeks later, like, what, what happened? What changed? And he said, uh, that boy, Eric, he didn't see, these are his words, not mine. He didn't see me as some homeless drunk. He just saw me. And maybe I could be like a friend of the family. I believe that he loves me. And I'm learning to believe that y'all do too. So we helped him get clean. We helped him go and do some detox and, and because it's dangerous those first several days. And we helped him get clean and we made sure that when he had a place, when he got out of, uh, of detox, he'd have a place to stay and food to eat. And more importantly for Bruce, work to do because he just can't sit still. And one of the first projects he undertook was the old tool shed that he was sleeping in when, when we first when we met him early on, that rotted out tool shed. He actually, uh, new floor, new walls, new ceiling. He refitted the whole thing and turned it into our city's first tool library. And so folks in the neighborhood come by and borrow tools. It's, not, it's about as complicated as it sounds. It's a library for tools. Power tools, hand tools, mowers, trimmers, you name it, we got it. We now have the third version of our tool library in, in the neighborhood. It is huge. Bruce absolutely loved it. It is entirely too big, and it was entirely too full within about 48 hours of being built. That's how it works, I guess. Bruce became one of our leaders, one of our strongest leaders, a missionary in our community. In fact, he came on staff with me as a missionary, as a missionary to the north side. He actually took over the ministries. He became the leader of the ministries that first met him in the neighborhood, right? He became one of our best gardeners in our, our urban farm, about an acre and a half of growing space where we do a lot of food, a lot of food, with our neighbors and with anybody else. Bruce is a prodigal brother, a prodigal son who came home, and our community is stronger for his presence, substantially stronger for his presence. Because that's the truth of the prodigal son story, is that people who have been loved well, love well. People who have been forgiven much, forgive far more radically. People who have been welcomed in when they had nothing to offer, turn around and welcome others in when they have nothing to offer. Bruce, who provided shelter in his new home to a man who had once tried to cripple him. Bruce, who loved powerfully and magnificently and furiously. Because here's the truth. It's the prodigal sons and daughters that learn from their father. Because they show up to the party. Because they know what it's like to see your father waiting for you when you come over the hill. Who won't let you finish your story. Because he can't bear to hear you ask for the thing that you shouldn't ask for. To ask for less than love. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to be with us and guide us. That you would move in our hearts even now and as we leave this place, 
that you would flow between us and through us and in us and that you would remake us to whatever it is you are calling us to be, that you would help us come into the party to celebrate our brother and our sister who's come home. In Jesus' name, amen.